Next, of course, we come to the tertiary structure. So this is the third level of organization. We've got alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. And these structures don't just exist on their own. They're not just in a line, one after the other. They twist and turn, and they integrate with each other to form a protein with a unique 3D structure. So here we have a polypeptide, and it's still just one polypeptide. And you can see we can spot a couple of structures here. We've got an alpha helix, and we've got one over here too. And you might be able to spot that here we've got an area of zigzagging. This is a beta pleated sheet. So the secondary structure are these shapes individually, but the tertiary structure is how they all link up with each other. And this is a specific fold into a 3G shape. And this fold is held together by different bonds. So the structure is held in place by bonds between the R groups of the amino acids this time. So last time we mentioned the secondary structures being held by hydrogen bonds between COs and NH groups of every amino acid. This overall folding up between alpha helices and beta sheets, etc., will be held up by bonds between R groups. So first of all, again, we can have hydrogen bonds, and this time they're between polar R groups. So this is different than the previous level. We can have different parts of the polypeptide chain. So this is the polypeptide chain. And what you'll see is sometimes there are these groups sticking out from the R groups. Some R groups are purely O's and H's, and they have these delta minuses and delta plus. Some R groups are amine groups, so they have another delta negative and delta plus. As long as the R groups are polar, hydrogen bonds can form. And so they would form between any delta minus and delta plus. And that might keep, for example, one alpha helix, which is over here, in close proximity to this alpha helix here. It can be all sorts of different arrangements. We can also have ionic bonds in the tertiary structure. And ionic bonds involve ionic charges. So they form between any positive and negatively charged R groups. So again, we're still talking about R groups. So in this case, we've got an R group with an H that has a positive charge. And in this R group, we've got a CO, which has a negative charge. And this will form an ionic attraction because opposite charges attract. So this is an ionic bond. And this will hold two parts of the polypeptide together as well. There's another special type of bond we tend to see only in proteins called a disulfide link or a disulfide bridge. And these form between any R groups that have sulfur atoms in them. So there's only a few that do contain sulfur, but as you can see, some of them do. And when they come in contact with each other, they form a bridge between them. So this is another type of bond called a disulfide link. So now we have lots of bonds holding the general fold together and the specific 3D structure is also determined by something else. It's also determined by hydrophilic and hydrophobic R groups. So the amino acids with the hydrophobic R groups tend to be found in the center of the protein. So here's our protein again. And remember, an amino acid can have an R group which can be either hydrophilic, i.e. it loves water, or it can be hydrophobic, in which case it hates water. Proteins spend a lot of their time surrounded by water. Proteins lie in the cell, they lie in our body. There's water everywhere, usually around the proteins. So it makes sense that the hydrophobic amino acids are going to point into the inside. So when we have a 3D structure of a protein, the amino acids with hydrophobic R groups tend to cluster all towards the center of the protein, pointing away from the water which surrounds it. And therefore you can imagine that the amino acids with the hydrophilic R groups found on the outside of the protein facing the water. So the water surrounds the protein, and these hydrophilic groups will attract the water, so they tend to face outwards. So this drive of hydrophobic R groups into the center and hydrophilic ones to the outside also helps fold up this specific shape. So bearing all of these bonds and structures in mind, the overall 3D structure is a result of R group properties and interactions, and the primary structure determines the tertiary structure. So up until this point, we've had a primary structure which was a sequence of amino acids. In the secondary structure, certain regions wound up into either beta pleated sheets or alpha helices. And this is held together by hydrogen bonds of the COs or NH bonds found on all amino acids. The tertiary structure is the specific interaction and folding of all of these 3D shapes into a unique shape. And this is driven by bonds of the R groups of the amino acids. So ionic, hydrogen, disulfide links, and the hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids. And then finally, we'll have another layer on top of this. So all of these interactions of R groups 
drive the tertiary structure. So by definition, the tertiary structure of a protein is the overall specific 3D shape of a protein. This is determined by interactions between R groups and the properties of those R groups. And remember, if the primary sequence controls which amino acids are present, it's going to control which ones are hydrophobic, which ones have sulfurs in them, which ones are positive, negative, which ones can form hydrogen bonds. Because it's all controlled at the primary level, this is going to dictate exactly how the protein folds. And we've already said this could be massively complicated, so the range of shapes is also massive too. The next level and the final level of structure for proteins is called the quaternary structure. So some proteins are only composed of one polypeptide chain. So once that polypeptide chain is made up and folded, that's it, the protein is finished. But it's the case that many proteins in the cells are made up of multiple polypeptide chains interacting together. So here we have a protein where we've got the purple polypeptide, polypeptide number one, and it's interacting with a second polypeptide, this blue one, polypeptide number two. And the protein can't work until these two come together. So just like it was with tertiary structure bonding, the polypeptide chains are held together by hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and disulfide links. So it's the same bonds we just went through with the R groups of different amino acids, but this time they're just happening between one polypeptide chain and the other polypeptide chain. And you can see that overall it's going to connect the two chains together. Sometimes in this level of structure we can get non-protein groups being added in, which we call prosthetic groups and they can be associated with the polypeptide chains, forming conjugated proteins. So here we're looking again at haemoglobin, and actually haemoglobin is made of four polypeptides interacting together. We've got two times polypeptide here, so two purple polypeptides, and they interact with two blue polypeptides. And in order for haemoglobin to work, it can't just be on its own, it has to have these prosthetic groups associated with the protein. And together, the overall mix of the prosthetic groups and the polypeptides makes a conjugated protein. And so the bonding of the different chains and these prosthetic groups results in the formation of proteins with very complex and very unique quaternary structures. So you can see the level of complexity is massive by now. So the quaternary structure of a protein is the specific 3D shape of a protein determined by the multiple polypeptide chains and or prosthetic groups bonded together. So some proteins stop at the third level, but some carry on to the fourth level if they have another chain, or more than one chains, or they have prosthetic groups, or both. So protein structure is really, really important. This isn't all random. The primary structure, the chain of amino acids, determines the secondary and the tertiary and the quaternary structures, and this is what gives proteins their unique shapes and functions. So it starts off very simple, but it's the simple level that controls everything else. Here we have the primary structure, which is the order of amino acids, and this dictates how the hydrogen bonds are going to arrange themselves to form structures like the alpha helix and the beta sheets. So this would be the secondary structure, and you only get these in certain positions along the chain depending on what the primary structure is. And then because of these structures, this dictates how the tertiary structure forms. Because of their positions and parts along the polypeptide, they only can fold up into one specific shape. So here we have all of those R groups on the amino acids linking together via different bonds. And if there is a quaternary structure, this again is driven by where these other polypeptides can bind onto. So we have number two, number three, number four, and where prosthetic groups can come in as well. So everything that bonds together and folds up is all driven by what instructions are given in the primary sequence. And because they can all have their own shape, every protein carries out its own specific function, like collagen and haemoglobin, as we said before. It's really important to maintain the structure the bonds that maintain the structure of proteins can be broken if we change the temperature or the pH. So any increase or decrease in temperature can alter the shapes of the bonds and how well the bonds stick together. And we can also increase the pH to make it more alkaline or bring down the pH to make it more acidic. Any of these changes will alter the bonds. And if any of these cause a change in the bonds, they cause a change in shape. And as soon as that shape change is lost from the protein, it's like a puzzle piece that no longer fits together, and so it won't work. This prevents the protein from being able to carry out its function, and we always describe the protein in this stage as being denatured. So here's the normal protein at its best temperature and its best pH. If we alter one of these or both, it ends up becoming denatured. The shape is lost and it can no longer carry out its function.
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.